everybody today. So my name is Rebecca, I'll introduce myself um, quickly first. Um, so I'm a mum of five kids. Um, we always wanted a big family. We both came from really little families and really little extended families. And um, rem I remember my Christmases with just snoring uncles sitting on the couch and that was about it. So no cousins anywhere or anything like that. And then also to our families, because we only had one sibling each. Um, there's only two cousins from all of that. So we thought, right, we're going to make sure that we have a bigger family. And also too, it was really important to us um, in our marriage that we were always really open to life. Um, we were, of course, incredibly fertile. Um, and I started out before we were married um, doing my midwifery training and then was a new midwife just before I had my kids. So I found that was just incredible for my own um, parenting and mothering and um, just awareness of myself. And I think I'd had a really good look empathetically into supporting women and especially from, I did a lot of work in South Auckland um, and Delivery Suite and that was a very incredibly multicultural, diverse and high risk environment to work in so it was incredible and I think it's really shaped my life. And then I went on to um, do my natural fertility training so Hannah and I do different methods that are fairly similar um, and um, there's a lot of research in common and a lot of the people who have been instrumental in terms of the science behind these methods because they are really beautiful scientifically proven methods. Um, yeah there's a lot of similarities so I've got experience with the Billings method um, and Hannah is the Crichton method so and we don't have an awful lot of teachers um, in New Zealand teaching it. There are a few that I can recommend. And then of course, Hannah um, is really awesome as well, but she's over in the States. So, so anyway, after I, after I did that natural fertility um, training, it was really awesome to be kind of an intimate part of people's lives, to be able to go and sit with couples, discuss their fertility. And, and, and I think, you know, we're all, like even from this, an example here of everybody, we're all from at such different stages in our lives, different ages. Um, I'm 41 now and so um, I've definitely, I've had enough kids and I feel incredibly blessed to have the ones that I have. Um, so I wouldn't be wanting to look at getting pregnant, but it's amazing how when you chart your cycle over time, and I've charted mine for years now, that you get um, such a good look into knowing your body so well, you know exactly what to expect. And when it comes to midwifery as well, I think I've been trained to know not to abnormalize the normal, not to have to go medical if we don't have to do it, and, um, and just keep things as normal and natural as we can. And then we can recognize really easily if things are wrong. So Hannah, thank you so much for joining us today. It's so super exciting because she's all the way from Nebraska. So yay for technology. <laughs> and, um, and what really struck me because we met um, um, online, um, thanks to awesome technology again. Um, and yeah, it really struck me. You're such a beautiful woman of faith and um, you've obviously got so much love. Um, and I really, yeah, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit more as well. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Yes, I'm Hannah. And so I'm in Nebraska, which is in the middle of the United States, in case you're wondering. So we're pretty landlocked, far away from oceans. <laughs> we have four kids and we're actually expecting our fifth baby in August. So we're excited about Yay! that. Yay! <laughs> yes. And um, but yeah, I met Rebecca on a different Facebook group and we've chatted and she keeps talking about how awesome this community is on your this essentialist group. And I've joined in the last two Wednesdays and I've seen it myself. You guys are so knowledgeable and so supportive of each other. And so this fertility care, the charting is really a good fit with your holistic natural lifestyle that you're all going for. And so Rebecca said that I teach the Creighton model and I also, I've also been trained recently in the FEM. It's just a different charting method, um, FEMM, -M, 
and so both of them are very similar, but um, I've really become passionate. I realized my passion is in working with younger girls and our daughters because I didn't learn any of this when I was a girl. Um, when I, I guess I was maybe 10 or 11, my mom gave me a book to read and it was all about uh, the anatomy of the man, man, boys and girls and how my body is changing through puberty. And it was really kind of weird and awkward. And when I was done reading, my mom asked me, so um, do you have any questions? And of course I said, no, because it was embarrassing and I didn't want to talk about it anymore. And that's about all we ever discussed with my mom. Um, I love my mom. She's wonderful. It's just, it's a hard topic to bring up sometimes and you don't, if you don't know it yourself, it's hard to bring it up with your daughters. So I really, um, my work right now, my goal is to bring this to young girls um, and teach our daughters, our younger generation, this stuff. So I just want to begin with talking about ovulation. Um, why are we worried about ovulation? Well, I will tell you it's not important only for making babies. Whether you plan to have kids or not, we as women need the regular fluctuations of estrogen and progesterone that happens in a normal cycle in order to have a healthy body now and in the long term. Um, I want to go over, I'm going to bring up um, some slides. Let me see if I can share my screen. If you can't see this, make sure you let me know. But so on this slide, it's just going over briefly what's happening in the ovary, what's happening um, with your hormones, and then it shows some cervical mucus at the bottom. So I didn't learn any of this as a girl. You know, when I got to health class at age 13 or 14, uh, we were kind of taught some basic anatomy and then we were given a list of birth control methods. And so basically it felt like we were just being taught how to prevent pregnancy. We didn't learn much about how beautiful our body is, how to take care of it, you know, the best way to preserve this fertility, this body. It was just how we need to teach these kids how to not get pregnant. So I want different for my kids. Um, I have two daughters right now and Definitely, I'm going to be teaching them this when they're old enough, and I want them to understand what's happening in their cycle and have that respect for their body, that self-awareness. So I didn't learn this as a girl. I didn't learn most of this until I began charting, and I started learning about my cycles. So if we look at the top, it shows these circles, and this represents the egg as it's developing and toward ovulation. So your period starts with your, your cycle starts with your period when the lining of the uterus sheds off. And at that time, one or two eggs inside of your ovaries is chosen to develop toward ovulation. And they develop inside of this cyst-like structure called a follicle. And when, as the follicle is increasing and growing, it produces the hormone estrogen. Once ovulation happens, that egg is released, it, that structure now becomes a whole new structure with a whole new purpose, and it becomes the corpus luteum, which produces progesterone. So these two hormones are key. We need estrogen, we need progesterone as women, and we need them in balanced amounts. And that's uh, often if women are having problems with their period or their cycle or their fertility, it's because these hormones are not balanced. So we see the first half of your cycle leading up to ovulation, estrogen is dominant. If we look at this blue line in the middle, this is estrogen. And as that follicle gets big and right before ovulation, estrogen rises. And it's this increase in estrogen which makes the lining of the uterus build back up. And it also makes the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus, it makes the cervix produce this cervical mucus, which is essential for fertility. This high quality fertile mucus is what keeps sperm alive and it helps 
the sperm travel through the cervix, through the uterus, to the egg where conception occurs. So on this bottom row, this is all different types of cervical mucus that the woman produces at different times of the month. Um, if we look at this one in the middle called the ES, high estrogen mucus, we can see it's actually, there's swimming channels and that's this high quality mucus that is caused by high levels of estrogen is where it actually helps that sperm migrate and makes the woman fertile um, right before ovulation. So once ovulation happens, that, um, the egg is released, then progesterone begins to rise and estrogen drops. And this progesterone then is important for, um, it helps nourish the lining of the uterus. It thins it out a little bit. It makes it secrete a highly nutritious fluid and prepares it for pregnancy. So if a woman doesn't ovulate properly or she's not making progesterone properly, her body, her uterus isn't gonna be ready for pregnancy basically and won't be, may not be able to maintain a pregnancy. So these, uh, this, this is what estrogen and progesterone do inside you know, as part of your fertility cycle. It's essential for this process for you to be fertile, but it also has effects on really every part of your body, these two hormones. And this graph right here just briefly goes over all the different places in your body that estrogen and progesterone has an effect. So obviously your reproductive system, your breast tissue, but it also affects your bones, your blood vessels, blood clotting, blood sugar, sodium, brain cells, and just your overall well-being, um, how you're feeling, your emotions. So estrogen in general has kind of a proliferative and stimulating effect on the, all these cells in your body, while progesterone balances it out and it has more of a re relaxing, maintaining, normalizing effect on all these um, cells. So if you're gonna have a problem with estrogen, it's always that it's too high. If there's a problem with progesterone, it's always that it's too low because likely because you didn't ovulate normally. So if estrogen and progesterone are not in balance, um, all of these body systems are gonna be off. And plus just your overall feeling of your mindset, your anxiety level is gonna be high. Uh, everything's gonna feel more stressful. Your sleep may not be as good. It's harder to relax. So, um, let me go back here. So, um, in general, estrogen stimulates the cell growth and progesterone balances estrogen's effects by normal, by regulating the normal cell development. Okay, so women who stop ovulating, maybe because they're taking the birth control pill or they have a regular ovulation, they're not having regular periods, maybe they have PCOS, there's something else going on, they're not getting these hormones in a regular cycle. And so they're at an increased risk for osteoporosis, certain cancers, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, infertility. And research shows that regular ovulation provides protection from all of these things. So by being able to chart your cycle out, you can see pretty well if you're ovulating normally or not. And so it's a huge health indicator for just your overall health. You may have heard the cycle being called a fifth vital sign. So it's in the same category as your, like your body temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, all those things that your doctor checks when you go have a checkup your cycle is just as important in monitoring your overall health. So we're really kind of lucky as women, we have this extra way to monitor our health through our cycle. And so our cycle is one of the first body systems that is affected if something is not right with your body and with your health, your underlying health. Um, I've heard it said that, you know, your fertility is, um, is not as essential as other your other body systems. You can live without reproducing and not being fertile, but you, you can't live without being, not being able to breathe correctly or not being able to digest your food correctly. So if there's something 
going on in your life. If you have too much stress, you're not eating well or not eating enough, maybe you're underweight, exercising too much, not getting enough sleep, um, maybe poor nutrition, some of these things or so many other things your fertility is the first thing to go. So um, when your cycle isn't healthy and you can see that on your chart, you really need to take heed of it. And it means there's something else going on that you need to check into. And uh, you shouldn't just cover it up with birth control. So, you know, uh, unfortunately birth control has become so commonplace nowadays that many of us, we started it young, it was offered as treatment for any cycle issue we might have, maybe PMS. You know, so many young girls have cramping, uh, heavy periods, you know, terrible PMS. Um, and the doctor says, well, the, the pill or hormonal birth control will normalize or regulate your cycle. And um, we just don't question it. I, I, just, I was on the birth control pill, actually I was on the shot for about a year, and then I was on the pill for about a year when we were first married because I just, just to prevent pe pregnancy because I didn't know any better and that's what the doctor gave me. And I didn't know what it was actually going to do with my body. Um, I know now that it, what it was doing and it, it, when we first tried to get pregnant, it took me over a year to get pregnant because I know that pill was really messed up with my hormones and it just took my body a long time to get back to normal. And that's when I vowed that I would never go on any type of hormonal birth control again. But I've learned over the years that our fertility is an expression of health. It's not a disease to be treated with a drug. If there's something wrong with your fertility or your health, then it needs to be treated. So um, just to go over briefly what's in the birth control pill and how it works, it's it uses steroid hormones, or so it's a synthetic hormone. And um, so, and it's not a human hormone. It, they're chemical messengers. They stop our body from this normal ovulation process, but they do not have the same beneficial effects on our body as estrogen and progesterone. So uh, when, when I'm talking about hormonal birth control, I mean the pill, there's the depo shot, and a Nuva ring, there's Mirena IUDs and different hormonal IUDs, patch, patch implants, all of these things. They use different, uh, maybe different synthetic hormones and different levels of them. But in general, they, they work the same way and they basically are shutting down your fertility. They shut down this healthy body system. So there's no normal ovarian activity. It's or in no balanced hormone fluctuation. You're more of it in a menopausal state if you're on one of these hormonal birth control because you're not having this normal rise and fall of estrogen and progesterone that your body needs. So we all know there's some side effects that come with the pill, but we're we don't always not always aware how prevalent it is. Um, one study that was released in the Medical Journey Journal of JAMA Psychiatry, it tested, studied 1 million women that were over 13. So it included teenage girls. It showed that if they were using hormonal birth control, they were significantly more likely to be diagnosed with depression. And their risk was greatest in teens. A follow-up study um, found that these same women who were taking hormonal birth control had a triple risk of suicide. This is pretty scary, especially for our daughters. You know, so many young girls being put on the pill for um, irregular cycles or PMS or whatever. Some other effects, um, side effects of hormonal birth control are a loss of libido or sex drive. Uh, it can cause less vaginal lubrication, even pain. It can cause hair loss. It, you know, some of the different methods cause um, what your body thinks is an increase in testosterone. So then you can start getting male pattern baldness and it's not easy to reverse. It can be a slow process too. So you don't always know what's happening. You don't know that it's the birth control causing it. Um, these hormonal birth controls can cause weight gain and increased risk for breast cancer, blood clots, 
Have you ever heard of a young, seemingly healthy girl or young woman dying suddenly from a blood clot? Um, I have myself, and I, a doctor told me once that um, if you ever hear of a young, healthy lady dying of a blood clot, it's likely because she was on the birth control pill. Can I just say too quickly, Hannah, um, I mean, it doesn't happen very often, but in, um, um, when we're thinking about mortality too and issues of pregnancy, you know, um, and em embolism complications, um, you know, we have significant numbers of that. I mean, it happens every now and again in New Zealand and it's incredibly heartbreaking when it happens. But, um, you know, a lot of these women have already been on their hormonal contraceptive and I think it is a high, it does put women at higher risk for issues like that. Yes, it does. And unfortunately, I think many women don't realize it's the pill or it's, it's their birth control that's making them feel so different. Um, change affecting their whole attitude and everything. It changes your brain actually. And then there's problems with it when you come off of it. So when you stop taking this hormonal birth control, all your hormones are trying to get back to normal now and trying to figure out what to do. And so you can have side effects there like acne, PMS, amenorrhea. So you're not, you're not per getting a period or cycling anymore. Um, and or PCOS. So you know, what can we do? What's the alternative to these um, hormonal birth control? You're all, you all have this natural mindset. And so taking these pills or this birth control is not natural. It's not good for our bodies. And so this is where fertility awareness comes in or the cycle charting. Now, some people often confuse this with the rhythm method, which is outdated. And at least over here in America, they call you know, it's often called natural family planning or NFP, and it has a bad stereotype. Um, if, if somebody said, if, you, if I tell somebody I'm using NFP, they're going to think, oh, well, then she, you're going to have more, lots of children. Anyone who uses NFP has lots of kids and because it doesn't work. But modern fertility awareness, all these methods that we're talking about, they're all scientifically based. And if you learn it from an instructor and you use it the way it's instructed, it is very effective in preventing pregnancy um, if, and, and in achieving pregnancy if that's what you want to use it for. Um, so if the effectiveness rates of most of these fertility awareness methods are as good as the birth control pill and all these other birth, hormonal birth control methods. They really are just as effective. And the beautiful thing is you can use them for, you can use your cycle charting however you want. You can use it to try to get pregnant or you can try to, or you can use it to not get pregnant. And there's no side effects. There's not, it's not hurting your body at all. And you can change your mind at any time because you don't have to wait for any side effects to wear off. So basically this cycle charting, it just involves making simple daily observations. The main observation that most methods use is observing your cervical mucus. And it might sound kind of weird, but um, I didn't even realize that my body was making cervical mucus. I had never really observed it before until I learned how to chart and now I realize it's telling me so much about my body and my cycle and it's pretty cool. So all it really takes is on your normal trips to the bathroom, you're just wiping with toilet tissue and then checking to see if there's mucus. Um, you're not making extra trips to the bathroom. It's, it doesn't take a lot of time. You do need to learn. There's, there's a lot of nuances to learn um, on the, learning the quality of the mucus and how to record it, but it's really no big deal. There's, there's a lot of methods that also use your temperature, taking your temperature each morning because once you ovulate and your progesterone rises, that increase in progesterone makes your temperature rise a little bit. And so you can use that. And there's other methods that might use LH testing or checking your cervix, some of those things. Uh, the two methods that I am, um, have learned both just only use cervical mucus. So it can, the cycle charting is very effective just using, just being, knowing how to observe your mucus. 
So um, I'm going to pull up now like what a chart actually looks like. So you can see Okay. You can see what a cycle or a chart will look like if you're actually charting. This has some extra things on it, but if we look at the bottom, these colored boxes, this is a whole cycle charted out. Each box is a day. And so the woman would learn how to make your observations during the day. And then at the end of the day before you go to bed you just mark on your chart um, the most fertile thing that you saw that day now there's paper charts um, most methods have a paper chart or a, a phone app i think most methods at this point have a phone app to make it convenient so you can do whatever works for you um, so the, the beginning of her cycle begins with her period and so at the end of her, the day she put the red for the bleeding. And then she would also, on her real chart, she would mark a description of what she saw that day of how heavy the flow was, if it heavy, moderate, and light, or spotting. And then after her period, she these, these gray boxes mean it was dry. She did not observe any mucus that day. And so those are infertile days. And then these blue boxes mean that she saw mucus. And so when she began to see mucus um, in her body, she knew that she was fertile and that her ovulation was approaching. And so all of this lines up with the, you can see her hormone levels above the estrogen shown in blue as her estrogen rises, her follicles growing, estrogen rises, she begins to see mucus. And then once the estrogen reaches its peak, she ovulates, her egg is released. And then right after ovulation, the estrogen drops. And so then that cervical mucus dries up and she has these gray dry days again. And so it's really cool as a lady, as a woman to be able to see your cycle charted out like this. Um, you know, when you begin to see mucus that you're fertile and um, you could get pregnant during that time. Once that mucus dries up and you're dry again, then you're infertile and that your ovulation has passed. And so we, besides knowing just when you're fertile and infertile, you can look at this chart and see if it looks healthy and normal or if there might be a problem. Now there's no, really no such thing as a perfect period or a perfect cycle, but we have healthy parameters. We know that a healthy cycle from one period, beginning of one period to the beginning of the next period should be approximately 24 to 35 days in length. Um, so it might vary a little bit from woman to woman and cycle to cycle, but um, if, it, if it's less than that or longer, then you may have a problem with your hormones or your fertility. Um, we also know that your period, the bleeding should last from three to seven days and you should have at least one day of heavy or moderate ble bleeding. If it's too heavy or too long, then maybe there's an issue. If it's too short and light, then maybe, maybe it's not a real period. Maybe that was just some unusual bleeding. And then also this post ovulatory phase. So after ovulation, this is really important part of your cycle to keep tabs on. Because once ovulation happens, um, the progesterone rises. And so the quality of this post ovulatory phase is directly dependent on your progesterone level because it depends on your ovulation and it gives you a really good indicator of ovulation. Um, we know that after ovulation, you should get your period nine to 17 days later. The average is 13 days. What's really cool is in each woman, her post ovulatory phase should be very stable and not very, very by more, more than one or two days. So once you've charted your cycle, one or two cycles, you should know kind of what your pattern is, how, what is the length of your post ovulatory phase. And once you know that, 
Well, my post ovulatory phase is always 12 or 13 days long. You'll know when to expect your next period. And you'll know if it's too short, then maybe my progesterone level is too low or I didn't ovulate normally. And this, then you, and you can just see this pattern going on. It's really empowering to see the pattern that um, of your own cycle. Um, can I jump in there too, Hannah? I think, um, you know, because there are different types of bleeding as well that Hannah kind of mentioned. And I think, um, you know, sometimes people start out with their menstruation because just talking about bleeding and particularly um, bleeding um, from menstruation, sometimes you can start out just with spotting, say, for example, for a couple of days. But a cycle always starts. You always just start to chart your new cycle with your first day of heavy bleeding. And so you can have a different symbol as well for spotting and what that looks like. And then it's really important with mucus too. Um, it's not just what you might, might see as well, but it's also the sensation of what you feel. Because I think as you're becoming more aware of charting, you, you, you also um, start to come in tune with how your body actually feels at that time. Because we all know that when when, our, when we start to come closer to, um, to ovulation, we're going to get other signs as well. You know, there's probably going to be like a fullness feeling um, in the vulval area, um, signaling, signaling fertility. Um, you also, when you do wipe yourself after going to the bathroom, you, you know, you can, you can have little words that are personal to you. And I think that's one really nice thing about charting personally for yourself, because then you can you can start to describe that mucus in a different way because especially for those of you who are breastfeeding and also um, people over the age of 40, you know, you do start to see these changes and then the lengthening in your cycle. And it's important to have good names and descriptions for that mucus. So say, for example, you, you would chart what the mucus looks like. So you could chart the color say for example if it's if it starts out cloudy looking for less fertile mucus and then it will start to look clearer as the pattern of the mucus changes and I think Hannah that was a really good slide that you put on with the mucus because that's under the microscope what the different structure of the mucus types look like and we know that in that pre-ovulatory phase that rising estrogen um, it's still creating quite a block in the cervix, but it's just starting to change. And, and like you said, Hannah, that's, that's, that's that nourishing um, mucus starting to form. And I think if we don't have good quality mucus in the first place, either because of diet or because we have been on hormonal contraception for a while, that mucus isn't gonna perform its role properly. And I think that's also a really important time to talk about the damage that you can have from um, hormonal contraception because if you have been taking it for many years, and I was on it as a young girl, um, I think um, you know there is damage to the cervix and the way that that mucus can actually function, it's not gonna keep sperm alive for as long. It's not gonna be able to nourish the sperm. It's not gonna be able to, um, of, Mucus has so many different functions, and I think um, it also has the job of killing off and getting rid of the unhealthy sperm cells as well. So I think um, you know if you've got per if you've got your own personal description of what that mucus looks like, and also what it feels like, and what sensation you might be actually having um, in the at the vulva, you can actually write that on your chart too. So that when you're approaching that peak day of your highest estrogen, then you know, wow, that was my peak day. And, and like, she, like Hannah's got there on the chart, then you'll have this sudden drop off as that, as that estrogen drops and your progesterone start to rise and, you will, and you'll see it. Do you want to go and are you going to go a little bit more into that, into um, rules or anything, Hannah? Do rules? The rules, the rules like post ovulation or anything, or um, it's okay if you're not. I can yeah, talk about I'll it. I'll give you a little bit. So, um, this post ovulation phase um, really gives you a good indication of your progesterone level, which is 
most women that have problems, they're struggling with low progesterone. And so if, if your progesterone is too low, maybe your, this post-ovulatory phase will be too short. And that's when you're going to feel PMS. Uh, you may have uh, get really moody, mood swings, um, that premenstrual spotting, uh, all of those things might show up. You might have extra mucus in that post-ovulatory phase. Um, and so also just this charting is really helpful. You were talking about just knowing kind of your energy levels and your understanding your moods and everything throughout your cycles. You can see whether you're pre-ovulatory or post-ovulatory and you can track that on your chart too. You know, what was I kind of in a bad mood today? Was did I have a lot of energy today? Maybe I was really tired and low energy today. You can see that then on all your charts lined up and get a pattern. Um, I think, and women kind of find out then that maybe in, in this post ovulatory phase, um, I start or right before my period, maybe I need to take more time for self care and get extra sleep. Or maybe in the pre ovulatory phase, you have more energy. And that's the time when you can you know, get things done. And so um, you also brought up breastfeeding and menopause. And so we're sewing like a, a cycle here, a menstrual cycle. But this charting can also be used if you're breastfeeding and you haven't gotten your cycles back. Uh, it's going to look different than this. But you should be able to see when you're charting where you start having this fertile mucus again. And that's going to then, you know, give you a clue that you're your ovulation and your cycle is returning. And so if you want to avoid pregnancy during that time, um, when you're breastfeeding, you can use it to, you know, still know each, you know, each day if you saw mucus or not, and if you're fertile or not. And so it can be used really well while you're breastfeeding before you've even gotten a cycle yet. And for, and for menopause, there's so much that goes on. Um, your cycle can shorten, your cycle can lengthen, um, but it can still be used really well too because you, you're just tracking those changes and you can see the changes that happen. Um, this is a good place to also mention how your cycle's affected by so many lifestyle factors, by your diet, by your stress, by exercise levels. Um, you're just, maybe you have illness or you're starting a new medication or something, your cycle will be affected by it. And so those are good things to note on your chart as well. If maybe, um, maybe you were sick, had a cold or something, or you're under lots of stress and you may, you will see it. Maybe you'll have this short post ovulation or ovulatory phase, or maybe it didn't look like you ovulated properly that month. Um, extra stress can cause delayed ovulation or you don't ovulate normally at all. So yeah, there's just, let me get back to so much that your cycle can tell you. Well, it's a good idea to really chart for a good three months to really see the pattern of your cycle. You can't just take one month and then <clears throat> go okay well that's normally what it is and this is and this is what makes it different from that rhythm method is which is so archaic because um we know that we're going to have a lot of different changes throughout the month with our bodies whether or not we've been incredibly high stressed um cortisol actually really affects um our estrogen levels as well as how the body um excretes uh estrogen from the liver and so it's all it's all completely dependent on yeah, and like you're saying, Hannah, with with even being sick. So I mean, that might mean that you can never take it for granted that you're going to ovulate the same that you did the month before. So um, and even even too with what you're saying about exercising too much and the amount that stress isn't always just being busy or being anxious or worried about something. It's just being way too active and. Um, and never knowing how to shut your brain off. So yeah, you will get signs of, of perhaps um, you'll think that you'll, like you'll see your mucus um, changing and maybe becoming 
clearer and thinner, you'll feel slipperier, and then all of a sudden that will turn off, and then and then you might notice that it's decreased a bit, and then the next day um, it's risen again. So you might so you've got to think, I mean, because in that chart you've got that lovely little ovum that's sitting there, and you're always going to have these backup ovums that are in a different phase of development from that main dominant follicle. And so that one, if it's not supported hormonally properly, it, will, it can die off. And then we might ovulate maybe a few days later. And so it's really, it's really important to get to know, right, what, what, is, what does it look like? What does it feel like? And chart it and just not take it for granted because I think this can really liberate us. I think in the past, um, with the lack of knowledge and medicalization, Natural fertility methods have, have, have you know, um, been seen as taking away that freedom. But I think once we get to know our bodies really well, it actually empowers us incredibly to um, see that beauty there and, and that our body's actually trying to tell us things. And then if we're, you know, um, under exceptional stress, we might say, oh my gosh, there's some spotting there in my in my cycle or then if we're wondering wanting to get pregnant um, we can also see different types of bleeding too that can give us a clue that we might be pregnant too so the more we get to know that um, um, the better and I think one really important thing to talk about here too is that this is not just fertility put in the hands of women because this is actually couple fertility which is so important to relationships and I I think there's such a breakdown in relationship <clears throat> these days and and often we are responsible for taking the pill and then if we've forgotten that it's our fault that we got pregnant say for example and um this actually makes it a couple fertility journey because then both of you can actually look at the chart and you can say oh and he can know oh right okay you're you're almost fertile if we're not wanting to make a baby then i'm just going to leave you alone or maybe um, you know, go out and do something nice for yourself, you know, so that we're not hanging around each other and getting pregnant. Or, um, And he will also know when your period's due, um, <clears throat> probably when your heaviest day is going to be that you might be, you know, lacking in energy or whatever. And so um, it's a really good way too to deal with PMS because um, if you are suffering from PMS premenstrually, um, then you know more awareness about your period and maybe thinking the week before hey maybe you and i shouldn't have share that bottle of wine uh three nights before my periods do you know and so you're just he's getting to understand your body as much as you are getting to understand it and it makes also if you're wanting to abstain and not have a baby it actually means that sex just isn't available all the time either and so having that open communication is fantastic for your body. And then when you do get to that um, post-ovulatory phase, there's quite a freedom in that. And I think it's quite renewing for relationships, wouldn't you say, Hannah? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, for couples that are using it, using the charting to avoid pregnancy, it's just this whole new level of communication with your spouse. Um, so many couples don't have to ever discuss sex or fertility or your bodies. And the couples I work with, they always mention that. They're like, well, we've never had to talk about this before, but now they do. And it's just this new level of connecting with each other. And, and consideration if, of one another. Exactly. Respecting each other. It takes both of you working together to be able to use it effectively. So... Yeah, definitely charting can be very effective for couples who don't want to get pregnant, but it's also really helpful for couples who are trying to get pregnant because you know when you're fertile and you know when it's the best time to try to get pregnant. And then if, if there's anything going on in your chart that doesn't look healthy, you can see that as well and try to get, get help, um, try to do something that boost your fertility. So I think too, um, it's important to know when to actually have sex if you're wanting to get pregnant. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, I, have, I can personally vouch for how well the charting works. With our first two children, I, we weren't charting, we weren't using anything, and I had pretty irregular cycles always, so I didn't know when I was fertile. I didn't know when to expect my period. 
And so it was pretty random. Uh, and like I said with our first, I was coming off the birth control pill and I know that made my body take a lot longer to get to a healthy fertility, but it took over a year to get pregnant. Um, and then with our second, I wasn't using any type of birth control, but still after, it took about nine cycles to get pregnant with her because we just didn't know when we were fertile. But then with our last three pregnancies, I was charting and we were pregnant within one or two cycles of starting to try. So it's just, it's very accurate. You know when you're fertile and you know when you can, it's best time to make a baby. And then too, if you can see that your cycle is regular and your mucus is normal and healthy, um, as well going back to that whole couple fertility thing, that's a really good chance for you to look into your husband or partner's uh, fertility as well. Because um, yeah, if you know that everything's right, and if you're having, trying to um, conceive at the right time, then you know maybe that might be a sign that he, that something's going on with him as well. Um, but I think, yeah, a lot of couples um, that I used to help chart their cycles, they'd be trying to have um, sex far too early in the pre-ovulatory phase. So if you think about how long sperm actually lives for and the fact that um, the structure of the, of the mucus changes as it gets more fertile because there's, there's so many different types of mucus leading up to um, ovulation. Um, you really need to be, like if you're really trying, you've got to think about the quality of the sperm because, I mean, if, if you've had sex too many days before your peak day, then the quality of the sperm is going to be low. It's also it's going to be lower in number. And, um, and also, too, if you haven't had a chance to develop healthy mucus because you've been um, on hormonal contraception and your hormone, hormonal levels are out, your mucus isn't going to have the ability to keep sperm healthy and alive for long enough before you ovulate. So you've got these little crypts that sit inside your cervix. And what they do is the mucus locks the sperm into those little crypts. And that's what can get damaged if you've been on years of hormonal contraception. So if in a case like that, if you can see that every month you're getting lovely, slippery, um, see-through mucus right on your peak day, then you're going to be waiting for that incredibly um, uh, um, fertile mucus before you have sex. Because if you're doing it beforehand, the sperm is just going to be flushed out if, this, if the mucus quality isn't good enough to keep it alive. Or otherwise, if he's got an unhealthy lifestyle, say, for example, or under really high levels of stress, then he's not going to be um, producing good quality sperm either that isn't actually going to last. Because because sperm can live for a long time. It can live up to a week. Um, whereas that, that um, ovum is normally, you know, I mean, maximum 24 hours. So, so you've really got to make sure that that sperm is going to be nourished when it's in there. And if you do have issues um, with your fertility or finding it hard to get pregnant, you've got to wait for that one or two days. And then also to that day straight after um, ovulation, after your peak day can also be a really high chance day to conceive as well. Yeah, uh, the male fertility, I think it's, uh, they're, they're find, doctors are finding that it's more, you know, 50% of the time when couples are having trouble conceiving, the male is part of it. Um, he needs to maybe be taking supplements or, you know, his sperm counts off. So that's an important piece of it. But, you know, this fertility charting can also be used, it should be used by single women, women, and really by any and every woman from puberty up on through menopause to monitor your health. I want to speak specifically now for benefits to young girls, to our daughters. You know, I didn't learn any of this growing up. I didn't learn much about my period or cycle at all. And you know, it's, it can be an embarrassing topic for young girls and moms don't always know how to approach it. They don't know what to teach their daughter, especially if they haven't learned much about it themselves. Uh, fertility is often seen as a burden in our culture and around here it's kind of taboo to talk about periods and it's embarrassing for moms and daughters to discuss and we see periods as annoying it can just be seen as just something to dread each month and but on the flip, flip side if girls can learn to understand their period and their body and what's actually 
happening in their body between between periods, what's going on with it in their cycle, she's going to feel more confident. Um, she's going to have that body awareness, body confidence, and she'll learn how to take care of her body. If she can understand how these hormone changes affect her mood and her energy, she's going to have the better self-awareness with these emotional changes she's going through. So my goal in my work right now is I'm working on an online course that will let moms and daughters sit down together, learn about their female bodies, how periods and their menstrual cycles work, and then teach them how to chart their cycle. Of course, all in age appropriate language and scenarios. But I'm really, I'm really excited about this course and I'm hoping to get it launched sometime this summer. So for the mom who doesn't know how to bring up the topic or for daughters too embarrassed to talk about it, the info will just be given to both the mom and girl. It's a good refresher for mom. And it brings up this subject of periods and fertility for them to discuss and everything about her body that um, is starting to change through puberty. Um, so, and you know, if you're like me, um, many moms are worried about you know, what their kids are learning from their friends, uh, through the internet, from movies and the culture or even what they're learning in school and health class. But um, with this course, my goal is that daughters can, they can learn the truth, the real science behind their body. And then their moms can become the go-to person, They're the confidant that, she, that daughter can go to when she has questions and concerns. And it's a new avenue of communication for them. Um, you know, hopefully the mom then can always be the one that daughter can go to with all of her problems. Um, for daughters that, you know, just think that their periods are annoying or they dread their periods, she can learn then that when she gets her period, it means I'm healthy. It means my body is working properly and she can just learn how awesome her body is as a girl because it really is amazing how women's bodies work. You can make this whole new life and grow it inside of you. She can be a mom someday and girls need to learn that and be proud and happy with being a girl um, rather than just dreading her period. So we can understand how our energy levels change through our cycle, how our mood changes. Um, you know, I, there's, it, I think it's pretty common that teen and tween girls kind of have an attitude and, and really bad mood swings. So if she's understanding how that lines up with her cycle and her hormones, how her hormones are changing, it just brings a new self-awareness. And on top of all this, um, she can see in real time how her stress level, lack of sleep, diet, exercise, all the activity she's doing, how that affects her cycle. And then she'll also know when to expect her period. Um, you know, per uh, Teen girls, as they're starting their period, it's notoriously pretty irregular and it can be kind of hard for her to know when to expect her period. But with the cycle charting, it can make that transition and everything a lot easier. So I read a great article and it actually did some studies on some different teen charting programs. And the first one actually followed some girls that were in like a juvenile delinquency center they'd gotten into trouble with the law and when they were taught how to chart their cycle they were also encouraged to write down each day what their um, like their mood and their attitudes were that day if they were feeling angry if they were feeling sad or you know whatever and they found that these girls they learned to um they felt more empowered and more in control of their mood when they realized that it was only just a phase in their cycle. Um, they actually found that most of these girls committed their crimes, like 90% of them had committed them during their like, pre-period time. They were having really terrible mood swings and felt depressed and angry, and that's when they were committing these crimes because their hormone levels were probably not balanced. I thought that was pretty cool. Another, um, the really awesome study was on a teen charting program that they used in um, some different countries. And when they 
followed these girls, they found that through cycle charting, the average girl was more likely to remain abstinent. And so abstain from sex at that young age. Just because the cycle, learning how to chart her cycle made her feel more confident and empowered, um, more in control of her body. So um, along with this course, I also want girls to understand how important diet and lifestyle and their environment is for their cycle health. So that kind of gets into, you know, what can we do to naturally help with healing cycle issues that you may have. So many suffer with heavy periods or PMS or cramping. Um, uh, the more I research and more I learn, the more I hear that just a good, healthy, natural lifestyle, good diet will clear up so many problems. Eating clean, whole food, lots of fruits and veggies, limit the refined sugars, vegetable oils, and you might possibly have to get rid of some of the gluten and dairy and some of those things that many people are sensitive to but don't realize is eating really nutrient dense foods clears up so many problems um, just like joe was talking about last week in her talk she had some health problems and then when she learned to change her diet and eat differently it took care of so much um, also Realizing what's in our environment and that there's so many chemicals in our food and the things that we use in our everyday life, we, we need to avoid endocrine disruptors. Now, endocrine disruptors are just chemicals that are found in a lot of plastic and conventional beauty products and cleaning supplies. So it, they mimic estrogen and thyroid, so your body kind of responds to them because when we absorb it into our body, but messes with your cycle. So avoiding plastic food and beverage containers and finding healthier alternatives to you know, your beauty products and cleaning supplies. Um, also, um, along with the diet changes, I do have a, a list of a few supplements that can really help with um, period health. Um, it's kind of a list here. Just Briefly, I'll say um, daily that magnesium is really important. And um, I have a, a, a friend who's a registered dietitian and she specializes in health uh, and eating nutritiously for a healthy cycle. And so magnesium is a big one that um, many people are deficient in, even if you try your best to eat healthy. Um, magnesium and then also B vitamins can be taken daily to help with a healthy cycle. Um, I have some other things here. Maybe I can just list them in the comments. But um, I can't stress like enough to all of you just how awesome the LLB is, the Lifelong Vitality Supplements, because those are your whole food supplements. And I mean, then because you've got all of you know the essential oils packed into them too, it's so important. And I think as as women, especially after you've had you know a couple of kids, our omega levels get quite low as well, and through breastfeeding too. So. I mean, I can't stress it enough. I notice a huge difference with supplementation with the LLB um, in comparison to other supplements that might not necessarily be as good quality. And, and it just means my energy levels are raised and I notice that my fertility increases. And also not just that, but um, just um, in terms of knowing that, yeah, I'm actually, yeah, my body is functioning hormonally at a much better rate when I can see that, that my um, fertility um, is just even more easy to chat. Good, and maybe Rebecca, you can talk now about oils. Um, yeah, yeah, I won't keep you guys for too much longer because I know that we've been going on. But I think, um, like for me personally, it, I find it quite interesting that the oils that I use and that I find so amazing for our cycles and for our women's health are all flower oils. They're all from that flower family of, um, oh my gosh, the most beautiful, precious oils. And I think um, they're also the oils that you would use for your perfume. So it's quite interesting to think of how much women use perfumes normally in their daily life and don't think about the endocrine um, issues that come and toxicity that come from using normal perfumes. And if you can switch to using um, 
your flower essential oils as your perfumes and, and just like your daily pampering. You know, like when you're at a stage in your cycle where you might be feeling a little bit low before you get your period or, um, and if you're wanting to enhance your ovulation um, and also too, just in terms of having healthy menstruation and, and, and cutting out like the spotting or bleeding that you might get kind of mid cycle. The oils are such a beautiful way of doing it. And for me, it's showing myself that self love. And I think ultimately what all of this comes down to in terms of talking about our cycles, we've got to remember that we're talking about our dignity as women. With, and we've got to be thinking in a bigger picture, am I really looking after myself? Am I giving myself the self-love and self-care that I need? Am I taking the chance to actually pamper myself, give my body the right nutrients that it needs? And that's where like, I find personally that when my oils turn up on my doorstep like they do to get here today, it's like my treat for the week. And so, yeah, some of the oils that are my face that are really, really, um, I mean, you've got your clary sage, of course, and you've got your um, clary calm, which I think is so incredibly vital to any, any woman's cycle. I mean, clary sage um, is, is such a beautiful one that you can, you know, um, even just massage onto your chest for really good breast health and also just around your stomach before ovulation, before you get your period as well. Um, it's such a gorgeous blend. And I mean, you've got lovely oils in there. You've got your clary sage and geranium, ylang ylang. And they're all such beautiful oils that are completely specific um, for women's health. And then also too, they can be really, um, really good for men's health too. So, you know, if he wants to give you a massage, then, um, you know, that it's been seen to have really good um, effects there too. So I think just quickly, clary sage um, is really, is a really great one. It actually increases serotonin um, in the body. So it's really, really important for brain function. Because when we think about hormones, we're going to be thinking about our hypothalamus and our pituitary, pituitary gland and the health of our brain. because that's the source of where our hormones come from. And, and in terms of um, healthy hormone function, we have to be thinking about a good brain function. So it's really interesting that um, it also, clary sage is also really good for um, endocrine function as well, of course. So we've got that brain and hormone um, link there with, the, with good brain health and endocrine function. So um, for me personally, I mean, yeah, I my favorite way is to use it topically um and just um you know we've got to remember about the importance of breath, breast health and i think um you know it's such a great way to be able to massage um for ourselves and yeah just at those times of the month when we really really need it so i mean in that one is geranium and with the clary calm which is the blend um, woman's health blend um with the clary sage and geranium is a really detoxifying oil. Um, so when we're thinking about healthy levels of estrogen and wanting to have a healthy balance of estrogen and progesterone, then we've got to think about how our body rids that estrogen that it no longer needs from our body. So if we've got a toxic system, an oil like geranium just can be so incredibly helpful. And you can't just be thinking of these oils as like, um, it's not like pain relieving oils that say may give you uh, that quick, quick fix. You know, you want to be using these oils at these stages in your cycle every single month, you know, to get a really good cumulative effect of them in your body. Um, so um, geranium is also really good for, for fertility because it's really good for increasing sex drive too, which is quite interesting. So another oil that I um, have really gotten into recently and I didn't realise the benefits and it's actually in the... Um, Precious Florals collection that's still available on the site at the moment with the Mother's Day promotion. And you can get it anywhere in a roller, um, in a roller bottle, um, in, a, in, a touch, in a touch bottle. So it's Neroli. And I didn't realize, along with Magnolia, so I use the two of them together, they just have absolutely beautiful effects. So we're more thinking about the emotional um, balance that we have around the time of our cycle. So neroli is especially recommended for people, you know, if they're in a state of panic or grief or shock or have really high cortisol levels. So we, we've got to be targeting ourselves emotionally as well because, you know, we are such emotional beings um, and that comes into our fertility so much. So <clears throat> really great for, oh, excuse me, have a drink of water. 
<clears throat> really awesome for reducing um, anxiousness and then as well increasing sex drive as well because you know you've actually got to want to if you're trying to make a baby you have to actually have a decent amount of sex drive anyway um, and then um, really awesome for your estrogen balance as well um, Neroli so um, another one that I said that I paired with it is Magnolia so that's also really good for irritability around the time of um, if you're getting PMS as well um, and really great for balancing out that estrogen progesterone um, balance. Um, and magnolia is often um, seen as the oil um, to um, help us to receive love as well because it's just so beneficial for us emotionally. So I think that's a really, really beautiful one. So um, also too, if you're wanting to treat yourself with jasmine and rose, because those are in the Precious Florals collection. I mean. They are just two of my absolute faves and they're so hard to come by. And those two are just absolutely gorgeous as well in terms of mood. Um, Jasmine's especially good for your uterine health um, and, and a really and healthy ovulation. So that's, that's one to really watch out for too if you're, if you're struggling around the time of ovulation, if you're noticing that your um, cervical mucus isn't quite behaving how it should. Um, and um, and rose oil. Rose is great for men and women, so that's a really great one for men to use as well to blend with something else. Maybe they might like that blended with neroli because it's not so sweet and um, girly smelling. But yeah, that's just kind of a bit of a rundown on it. But yeah, like I say, <coughs> um, yeah, make the most of those LLV supplements because I just, I mean, I just can't stress it enough. And I think, yeah, we need to realize that beauty and dignity in our bodies, as soon as we start seeing that our fertile, that, that our fertile ovulation is actually a gift, you know, we start to view ourselves in a totally different way. And I think, Hannah, I'm really excited to get details of the course that you're gonna get, and I know that you'll post it um, for us and, um, and how to register. And I think um, this can be really liberating. We've got to, um, we've got to raise girls who, a beautiful body awareness, who who understand that it's a gift, you know, it doesn't have to be a burden, and that we can actually take a lot more control of our lives. It doesn't doesn't have to be something that's scary. And then, as we grow older, and we start to reach the end of our fertility, then we'll know that it's something natural. And we probably, because we've done things in a less chemical way, we'll end up having lower rates of PMS, lower rates of issues with with menopause. Um, and side effects, and it just ends up leading us to much healthier living. Yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to say, Hannah? Oh, not much, just thank you. Um, if you want more information about the course, here's, I'll, I'll post a place for you to sign up just to get updates from me on it. It's all online, so, um, and I just wanna thank everybody. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for listening in. There's, there's one question here. Do you have any specific natural advice for PCOS imbalances? Um, yeah, I'd be really looking to your oils and um, liver support. Um, Buffy put a great comment here. I, I really think diet has a lot to it, being at a healthy weight. Um, yeah, there's a lot you could say about that, but yeah. And ultimately too, um, if we're using essential oils, they're gonna be reducing the inflammation in our bodies as well. And that's a really, really important one when it comes to PCOS on any kinds of hormonal um, issues. Um, yeah, the more we can reduce toxins in our lives, I mean, that's the, that's, that's the best bet. And with PCOS, you really need to be chatting. So I think um, too, we can put information at the end too for um, different teachers who are available to be able to teach you because you can't just start charting by yourself. I think it's really important that you get a professional to help you do it properly. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah, lady. Oh, what does the rose do for men? Oh, sorry. Were you gonna ask a, somebody can ask something? Oh, rose is, rose is really good for um, sperm production, also for any kind of impotency issues and prostate health. Rebecca? Yeah. Um, oh, Rebecca and Hannah, I had a question. But, oh, but first of all, thank you so much for that presentation, Hannah. It was awesome. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's really, really nice just hearing someone else's perspectives on 
fertility and women's hormones and cycles. I always learn um, something new, so that was really great. Uh, and can I say as well, our first overseas presenter uh, in our Wednesday wellness workshop, so that was very exciting. Um, I had a couple of questions. So you talked a lot about um, uh, charting cycles for your clients. What do you do if, because what do you do? I have quite a few clients who have very, very low estrogen levels, and so they're not even getting um, the, like, the egg white mucus to start with, and so charting is very difficult for them because they're not getting any, any signs. What do, you, um, you know, what do you normally recommend, or what's your next, next steps of actions if you have a client like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I do have a lot of clients that are they're infer infertility clients, can't get pregnant, or younger girls yeah, with issues. Um, I always refer them on to a doctor. Um, I really want to be able to refer them to some of these natural methods, um, fixing their diet and so forth. But I always refer them on to, um, there's doctors trained in this. Um, they know how to read the chart and then they use the chart to help diagnose what's going on. And like their whole goal is to find the underlying issue and treat it to fix the problem so they can just have healthy cycles. Mm. So looking for like a naturopathic doc doctor or a functional med doctor. Um, the ones I refer to here in Nebraska are nephrotechnology doctors is what they're called. I'm not sure. Yeah, we do, we do have some and some who are based in Australia who are quite good. I think mm -hmm. it's important too, like some women like that might just get one day that they notice a change. And that might be all that they need. Not everybody is going to show that really amazing, healthy mucus, but it doesn't mean that they're not ovulating. I think that's really key to remember. Mm. Yeah. I think for everyone who's listening, though, if you haven't charted your cycle before or just um, had a look at the, you know, had a look down at the, at the mucus, it's really amazing once you see it once. If you, you know, just look at it uh, over, over the course of a month, once you see it once, you, I just remember the first time that I did it myself and I went, Gosh, it's so different. Like the texture and the look, and it, it's exactly how they describe it. It's so, so different. And once you've seen it once, it actually becomes quite easy. You know, you sort of naturally go, oh, look, it, it's, it's changed to that. You, um, so, yeah, I really. So women, women as well who aren't seeing that mucus, they need to look for the other fertile signs. So they can look, they can look for that fullness that they might feel in the vulva. And also too, they can go with the lymph node signs. So when you ovulate, you're always, well, often in a lot of women, you'll be able to feel that lymph node rise up on whatever side the fallopian tube has released the ovum from. So that's another sign that you can use. Mm. Um, and then Shannon, you've said that um, you went to see an endocrinologist who helped you as well. So I think that is really important. You've got to know your limit. Um, also, when it comes to irregular bleeding, pain, heavy bleeding, um, and clotting, it's really, really important to go for help. But I think this is the bonus of charting. We become advocates for ourselves, so that's really important. Did anybody else have any questions? Um, I just wanted to mention um, about stress and how that affects our cycles. Um, I am sort of roughly aware and you might be able to um, clarify this Buffy that when we stress um, the to make the stress hormones um, of cortisol our body um, uses up um, progesterone to do this and so therefore we can end up with um, low progesterone and then therefore an excess of estrogen which then tips up our cycles and that's where we can get just really crazy fluctuations um, from month to month or, or over a series of months where we might not be either ovulating or that um, second phase in our um, cycle is much shorter because we've got low of progesterone because of stress and things like that. So I think, um, it, of course, diet is incredibly important, but also um, learning to manage your mental stress and, and also in a way mental that's sort of mental stress, it's physical stress as well, because we can get so caught up in running around so quickly um, that we're almost in a bit of a flight and fight mode, even though we might be happy, um, we're just doing too much um, and that can have um, impacts on our cycle as well. So yeah, I mean, for me and my 
experience over my life um, that has played huge impacts on my cycle. And so um, it's been something I've worked on a lot is just keeping much calmer and um, not rushing around so much and really allowing the body to just have a rhythm and a real cycle, you know, that knows what's coming each day and things like that. And knowing how to say no, mm. um, having safe boundaries, and yeah, getting out your florals and your citruses for your emotional health, incredibly important. Shannon, did you find for you when you, you said that you had, didn't have a period for many years, did they say that that was because of uh, excess estrogen or, or high levels of estrogen because of, the low, because of low progesterone from stress? Yeah, so it was a combination of stress that too much stress, which was actually um, causing me to lose a lot of weight. And mm -hmm. so I didn't have a healthy BMI. And so I wasn't within that range. And so when I was able to deal with the stress and bring my weight back up, um, I was able to um, have a normal menstrual cycle. And so during that period, like it was like six years in my 20s that I didn't have any cycle. So there was no mucus to chart. Um, and also they made sure that they checked me, um, did bone density checks as well, because with not having a good balance of estrogen, there is that um, possibility of getting osteoporosis. And it did, it did slightly affect um, my bone density tests, but not too, not too severely. So, yeah, mm. weight is a big, a big, big thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And for those, for the ladies who are unsure about that, you can just go online and just look up, just Google BMI calculator and generally being somewhere between 20 and 25 on average, like everyone's got different types of bodies. So, you know, a really muscular um, Polynesian woman is going to be, have, have, a, have a stronger uh, frame than a, a very sort of small, slight Asian lady. But in general, somewhere between 20 and 25 is a is a good indication of, of where you want to be for your body to even be producing enough estrogen to create the hormones in the first place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, with the stress thing, Shane, just to answer that question that you had, often what happens is if we're really highly stressed, um, the high cortisol levels actually send a signal to the brain um, and it's, a, it's called the HPA, HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary axis, and it actually just sends a signal to it to almost shut off. And it's that a bit in the brain which signals down to the ovaries to actually release an egg each month. So if you are super, super stressed, the brain just basically goes, there's a war outside, there's a coronavirus. What, you know, we, we don't, we don't even want to release an egg. So there's even a chance for, for fertilization right now because it could be dangerous for the baby. So the problem is, is the stress is not a war or a, you know, anything real. It's actually, it's just um, sort of a, this uh, anxiousness and hyper like you were explaining, you know, busyness, hyper sort of stress situation. If we're starting out, I think, to begin with, with teaching our girls about the beauty of their bodies, we're actually going to reduce a lot of the risk for these things later in life. If they do carry a little bit of extra weight that they're not happy with, or if they are underweight and they're not happy about that, you know, they're still going to love their bodies because they'll ultimately realise what a gift it is. Um, because you know my daughter now she's 14 she's carrying a little bit of extra weight she says her thighs are huge and they're not they're just beautiful and and maybe she needs to kick her butt and get her butt around the block a little bit and go for a walk or a bike ride and we've been talking about it and about that body image and I taught her her cycle really really early when she was 11 before we even talked about sex and I think you know you don't even have to bring the sex topic up for a little bit and she now, whenever we talk about it, will talk about how beautiful she is. And then it will actually motivate her to make change if she wants to make the change herself. So, you know, we need to make a new generation of different ways that women think about their bodies. And this, this is the way to start. Thank you, everybody. I think we've gone on pretty long. Is there anything else you wanted to say, Hannah? Nope, I, I think that's it. I just thank you all. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you so much, Rebecca. You guys are absolute gifts from God. So we have learned, I've learned so much. Um, and I'm a stepmom to two girls, one who's just started getting her periods. So I feel empowered by this to be able to talk to them now.